if there's no more testimonies, uh, let's pray, brothers and sisters, and commit the word into the Lord. Father, we want to thank you for your goodness and your loving kindness and tender mercies. Lord, I believe you have a word in season to, for him who is weary. Lord, we thank you. Your word is water. Father, that will refresh us. Lord, oh Father, we thank you and therefore we praise you. Father, as I submit myself, Father, I pray that I will be wholly available to you so that you alone will speak and not me. So, Father, I give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' almighty name. Amen. Amen. I like what, uh, I think it was Paul Karam who came to our church. Pastor Paul, he said, uh, sorry, Daniel Karam, he said, I like to give uh, <laughs> um, many Bible verses so I know whatever I say is scripture. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, you know, um, it's from the Lord. So today I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. So, <laughs> so I know it is, uh, it is uh, from the Lord. So praise God. <laughs> so praise God. So I was thinking actually uh, as to what I should say. And even from last period, the Lord was teaching me certain things, and I thought I will share it with you, uh, my brothers and sisters, and that is about humility. So, you know, we, we hear so many things about humility. The Bible is full of verses. If you go to the book of Proverbs, you will be inundated with verses on humility. So I think I, I will give you homework. Please go to the book of Proverbs, read it day in and out. You know, it tells us about humility, how to be humble, how to, how to control ourselves, you know, how to uh, be um, uh, humble uh, before God and before uh, man. So, without any further ado, let's go. Um, so, humility is the number one character trait of a Christian. That is it. Humility should be the most important character trait of a Christian or anybody who profess to follow Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Why? Because we see in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Lord Jesus plainly sets out his terms of discipleship. He says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. He didn't say, if anybody who comes after me must be loving, must be caring. No. If the number one trait of a Christian or a follower of Christ or a believer is that they deny themselves. They are not selfish. They are humble. That is the number one. And then humility opens up the gateway to all other characteristics. Like a humble person is always loving. A humble person is always trusting in the Lord. A humble person is always um, kind and faithful. You know, humility opens up all other um, character traits of uh, Christians to follow. Um, let's read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. So, believe, so you heard, Chris, uh, humility is the number one, um, you know, characteristic we should have as children of God. Now, Ephesians 4.2 says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long sufferings, bearing, forbearing one another in love. So with meekness and lowliness comes all other character traits. Because if you are not a person who is humble, you will not be able to bear up with your brother. Because we all are not the same. Some can get easily uh, upset, some can take time to get upset, some will talk out of term, some will keep quiet, they will not speak a word. So we, we are all different. So in order to make allowances for all of us and to understand each other, we need to be humble. And then we can, it will lead to uh, abil the ability to long suffer, to be patient, to forbear one another in love. So what is humility? What I thought of humility is found in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife 
or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each other esteem others better than themselves. That is humility. Humility is not making about me, myself and I. No, humility is about others. Humility is about that you esteem or value others above yourself. Now listen, we all have strengths. Some are better looking than the others, some are more academic and studious than others, some, some are gifted in many other ways, right? So some, some people can run faster, they can win races, whereas some, some of us can't even uh, hop or skip or jump, right? So, uh, you know, we all are different. So humility is not thinking less of yourself. If you know you can do something good, right? But humility is not allowing what you know to belittle others. Just because you think you are better looking than the rest of us doesn't give you the right to belittle your brothers or sisters. Just because you think that you, know, you have a lot of money than the rest of us, it does not give you to belittle those of your brothers and sisters who are poor. We are all, even with all you have, you have to esteem others better than yourself. So my brothers and sisters, therefore, humility is a state of mind. It is the lowliness of mind. Amen? So let's read Philippians chapter 2, same chapter, verses 5 and 6. Let's read 5 first. 5 says, let this mind be in you. Whose mind? The mind of Jesus Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ. So humility is the state of mind. Right? So verse 6 says, Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. You see, he did not think less of himself. He knew he is God. He knows that he is God. He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. If God is here, Christ is here, same level. Not beneath, not above, equal with God. He is the son of God, he is God and he is equal with God. Verse 7 but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. That is the mind of Jesus Christ. He, didn't, he did not think less of him, but he made himself of no reputation. In other words, what we have to do is, humility is not demeaning us or thinking less of ourselves, it is thinking about ourselves less. Do you get it? It is thinking about ourselves less. That means we need to take ourselves out of our mind and replace it with others. You see, if Lord Jesus only made it about himself, today we will all be lost. If we had not taken that form of a bond servant, today you and I, my brothers and sisters, will have no hope. Right? So that is humility, not demeaning or belittling yourself, but thinking about yourself less. And in fact, not thinking about yourself at all. You know, uh, uh, sorry, uh, um, John the Baptist said, I must decrease, he must increase. But mind you, when John the Baptist said that, he was still in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, what does Paul say? I must completely be dead. No 25% me and 75% God, no. No 99% God and 1% me. I must decrease, he must increase, that is Old Testament teaching. In the New Testament, I must be completely off. It's all of him and less of me. None of me, thank you. None of me. 
So praise God. So that is humility, my brothers and sisters. Philippians 4, verse 5. Let your moderation or gentleness or humility be known to some men, few men, most men, all men. Yeah, it, it must be known to all men. So that means, brothers and sisters, my humility must not only be subjected to the boundaries of this Lighthouse Fellowship. No, my humility must go and exceed beyond the four corners of this church. It must be visible and in full display to all men. That means, that, yes, the awkward, awkward um, colleague of yours at work, yes, they should see your humility. Or, you know, your family member or this neighbor, <laughs> you know, right now back home we are having issues with uh, our neighbor, so I tell my mother, you know, we had to show humility. And my mother is saying, fine, if they, uh, you know, uh, if, if we, instead of going into litigation, if we can talk and stop things, we are happy. So thank God. So, you know, um, you know whatever it is, we need to show our meekness. Your neighbor might not know what you are going through, or you may not know what your neighbor is going through. Regardless, we as children of God have the right to show and display our meekness to all men. And furthermore, it says, the Lord is at hand. So my brothers and sisters, when, when Paul said that, this was 2,000 years ago. So how much more is Lord at hand now then? Right? So, as and when we get closer and closer and closer for the arrival of Lord Jesus Christ, we need to get more and more and more humble. This simply means that when we get closer and closer to the Lord's arrival, humility is going to be a rare commodity. You will not find it anywhere in the world. Shall we read uh, 2, Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3? It gives you a whole list of things that you are going to see when we get more and more closer to God, uh, God's arrival. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Number one, it's going to be we are going to be loving ourselves rather than loving our neighbor. You know, we are going to be, people are going to be selfish, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, and the list goes on. When you go home, you can read the rest. So my brothers and sisters, towards the last days, this is how the world is going to be. Proud, lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, but instead, God is expecting his bride, his church, to be different. We, when the world is becoming selfish, we ought to be more and more selfless. Our humility, our gentleness, our meekness must be shown to all men. Now, Romans 12, verse 16. Romans chapter 12, verse 16. I like, let's read it in the New King James Version and afterwards I'll read it in um, Amplified Version. Yes, I really like how the Amplified Version puts it. Be of the same mind toward one another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Amplified Version says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, meaning conceited, self-important, exclusive. Haughty simply means excessively proud. But associate with humble people, those with a realistic self-view. Do not overestimate yourself. In other words, do not think you know it all, because we don't know it all. 
I like what the amplified version says. Do you know, if someone is conceited, if someone is excessively proud, do you know that it is an illness? And that illness is called narcissistic personality disorder. Narcissistic simply means it's all about me. You know, this is the same sickness that the devil is suffering from. Devil is also suffering from this same sickness. He thinks it all about himself. So if we show characteristics of this illness, that means we've been hanging out with the devil and it's rubbing off his sickness has been rubbing off on us, right? So please be careful. This narcissistic personality disorder simply means one of the several types of personality disorders. It is a mental condition in which people have an inflated sense of their own importance. That's why the word of God said, we just said, do not overestimate yourself. They have a deep need of excessive attention. They want all the attention to themselves. And admiration, troubled relationships and lack of empathy to others. They only have they themselves in their mind, not about others. So my brothers and sisters, watch out. This can even be a sickness. So what did Lord Jesus say to people who try to be narcissistic? Or what did Lord Jesus say for people who try to be number one? We see that in Mark chapter 9 verse 35. And he sat down and called the twelve and saith unto them, If any man desires to be first, the same shall be the last of all, and the servant of all. You see, this is how we overcome selfish ideas, selfish thoughts. You know, we can't stop these thoughts coming into our mind. Right? We are not robots. We, we have thoughts, oh, oh, you can, oh, you know, I sing better than that person. Obviously, those kind of thoughts can obviously come to your, our minds, but we need to bring it captive to the obedience of Lord Jesus Christ. I say, no, that's fine. I value that person better than myself. Lord says so, and I wholeheartedly do so. That is it. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 first. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yeah, all of you subject to one another. So even elders have subject, must subject to the youngers. Not We mustn't only expect the youngers to subject to us. But God says we must all subject to one another and be clothed with humility. This word humility in Greek simply means a slave putting on an apron before serving the master. That is what it means. So put on the apron before you serve the master. That is clothing yourself with humility. So this is exactly what Lord Jesus did, didn't he? When he washed the feet of the disciples, the word of God says he girded himself. He put on that apron of the slave before he went and served the 12 disciples, washed the feet of the 12 disciples. So my brothers and sisters, let's read John. We'll come back to this, but uh, we know the story of uh, Lord Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. But let's read um, John chapter 13, verse 3. I need to, uh, this verse really blessed me and I want to share it with you because this gave me the reason why Lord Jesus was so easily able to stoop low. Now, why are we finding it difficult to bend down, to stoop so low, to make, to think the other person better than ourselves? Why? Because we are so scared that if I bend down, someone will take my place. You know, we are, full, we are mindful of ourselves, of ourselves. Now, verse 3 says, John chapter 13, verse 3 says, Jesus knowing, underline that word knowing, 
knowing that the father had given all things to himself and that he was come from God and went to God. He knew that I, my father has given everything to me. I came from the father and I'm going back to the father. That knowing that was enough for him to bend down and to become a slave. You see, it is knowing your identity. So when you know your identity, that you are a son of God, all other petty thoughts about, oh, if I bend down, that person will take my place. Oh, if I keep quiet, they will try to uh, ride, you know, walk all over me like a carpet. All of those kind of thoughts, they become shadows when you know your identity. Because Lord Jesus knew, if I stoop down, hey, I'm the son of God, nobody can take my throne. So he knew that. So in the same way, know your identity. Nobody can take your place. So that should enable us all the more to bend down and to serve my brothers and sisters. Amen. So that was such an eye opening for me. When I said, he knew. It's the knowing. Know who you are. Know your identity. You are a son of God. And we don't have the courtesy to, we don't have the, the luxury to be selfish. You know, we can easily stoop low and, and uh, serve our brothers and sisters. Now, uh, on, in, on the same chapter, let's read verse 17. John chapter 13, verse 17. If, uh, sorry, let's read from verse 15, I beg your pardon. For I have given you an example. Now Lord Jesus has given us an example that you should do as I have done. Brothers and sisters, we are without excuse. If God, being God, can stoop so low to, to do it, what excuse can I or you give? Verse 16. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than, the, than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that is that sent him now verse 17 if you know these things happy are you if you do them uh, in new king james version say if you know these things blessed are you so my brothers and sisters you don't have to worry about and ask god to bless you when you walk in humility Blessing will follow you and overtake you so that every step of the way you make, you'll be making in the blessing. So my brothers and sisters, walk in humility. When you walk in humility, blessed are you. So much so, Amplified Version says, blessed simply means others who are around you will be jealous of you. That is how God can bless you if you continue to walk in um, humility. Right, so going back to uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 5 to 6. Now we here see the danger of being proud. Uh, verse uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 5. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yeah, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. This is from where we took off. Now coming back, for God resisted the proud and giveth grace to the humble. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Mind, note, underline these words, resists and gives. They are all in the present tense. That means it is something God is doing right now and here. And something that he will continue to do. He will continue to resist the proud. God will never get fed up. God will never get tired. Oh gosh, I've been resisting these people. I'm going to stop. I can't be bothered with them anymore. No way. God will never ever give up resisting the proud. And that is the, that is the dangerous thing of being proud. Because when you're being proud, it's not the devil who is going to be your enemy. 
it's God who is going to be your enemy. Now you see, if at least I was thinking to myself, that's dangerous because if the devil is after me, I can rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus. But if Jesus is after me, if God is after me, how can I rebuke him in his name? You can't. So why pick up a fight with God? Why pick up a fight that you can never ever win? Right? So my brothers and sisters, God resists the proud. It doesn't matter whether you are a son of God or a daughter of God or even an unbeliever. It does not matter. He simply hates pride. And he gives grace. And it's something that he keeps doing and he will forever continue to do. Keep giving undeserved favor. That is grace. And he will continue to do that. Do that. If you are humble, everywhere you go, God will make sure doors are open to you. Everywhere you go, that is grace. That is undeserved favor of God. Amen. Now, verse 6. Verse 6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So brothers and sisters, exaltation is the next step. When you are humble. When you humble yourself, God is going to elevate you. God is going to exalt you at the right time, at the due time. That is why, you know, if you don't see, God, I'm being humble, I'm being humble, but nothing's happening. The word of God says, if you are doing what is good, keep doing it. In the book of Galatians, God says, if you're doing what is right, keep doing it. And at the right time, God will exalt you. So my brothers and sisters, you see here, God is giving you and myself a chance to humble ourselves. God is saying, no, 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 no. I'm not going to do it for you. You do it. You humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. You see, brothers and sisters, it is a state, humility is a state of mind and we therefore need to take an action. Therefore, humility is a choice. You can choose to be humble or you can choose to be arrogant, proud, selfish. Lord Jesus, what did God say? I said before you, life and death. You choose. And he said, if also you don't know what to choose, Choose life. That is the answer. So my brothers and sisters, if God sets before you pride and humility, pick humility. Because when we walk in that path of humility, we are blessed. There is, we are going to um, uh, receive unmerited, undeserved favor from God. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. One of the... Uh, one of the very famous verses. Lord Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find a rest unto your souls. You see, brothers and sisters, a proud person can never be at rest. Right? Can it? Now, I will give you one example. When we were studying the book of Esther, we saw the character of Haman. How this Haman was never at rest until Mordecai was put to death. Can you, he was plotting his, you know, that is pride. He, he was next to the king Ahasuerus. He was next to the king, he was like the king's prime minister. So here you go, a man having almost everything he can have, his joy, his rest was disturbed because one person out of the entire kingdom did not bow down to him. You see, that's what proud can, pride can do to you. Proud people can never, ever enjoy the rest. But God said, Lord Jesus said, come, learn from me. You know, learn from me. I am lowly. Did you see, have you ever seen Lord Jesus worrying? Have you ever seen Lord Jesus you know, 
I don't know what to eat tomorrow, you know, what to wear tomorrow, where he said, I don't even have a place to lay my head. Animals at least have a place to call their home. I don't even have a place to lay. But he was never, ever disturbed. He was always composed, he was always calm, he was always cool, and he was always at rest. And the same rest he is willing to give to you and me. The same rest, you must be going through so many problems right now. But if you walk in humility, that same rest God is going to give to you and I. Amen. And other thing is, he says, learn from me. So humility is something to be learned. Now wait, all of you are, I'm no well-learned, well-educated people, and you did not achieve your qualification, whether it is degree or certificate or diploma or whatever, just overnight. It took time. It took years and years of studying, examinations and all that, and then you got your certificate, and then you got your qualification. So you had to put in what? Dedication, commitment, you had to actively hard work, actively and intentionally pursue your course. You didn't give up halfway around, halfway through. You went all the way to the end to achieve it. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, when you are learning humility, you got to put your entire effort into it. You need to put your dedication, be committed, be intentionally and actively pursuing humility if you want to learn humility. And the good thing is, or uh, the challenging part is, Lord Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. That means you're only ever going to learn humility not just by reading the Bible, not just by hearing to a, a sermon about humility. It, taking the yoke upon you simply means practical knowledge. So it's learning humility is not going to be based on theoretical knowledge. It's going to be practical knowledge. That means you will only ever learn humility when you keep practicing it. So you got to be dedicated to practice humility even when you get so tempted to give that person the right piece of your mind. Right? So that's when you will have to learn humility. You have to practice it. God will ensure he will, you will have many awkward people come in your way to say things that's, that might rub you off the wrong way. Practice humility. You will only learn humility in practicing it. Right? So, let's read... Uh, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 5. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 5 says, Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Please underline everyone. Everyone means everyone. It doesn't matter whether you are a believer or whether you are an unbeliever. So long as you are proud, you are an abomination. Or so long as I am proud, I am an abomination. To the Lord. And see, pride is a state of the heart. Pride is a state of the heart. And when your heart, uh, if everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord, though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. So my brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter. You or I will never escape the punishment of God if we are proud. This is as sure as the morning sun. You and I will be punished. We'll never go unpunished if we are proud in our heart. Let's read Proverbs 16, verse, eight, uh, verse 18, a few verses down. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So, fall or destruction or devastation is guaranteed. Full stop. Just like blessing is guaranteed when you walk in humility, fall or destruction is guaranteed. You cannot uh, boycott it. You cannot escape. It is guaranteed. It is a sure thing, a definite 
thing. It is guaranteed. Now I'll give you some examples. We know we speak of highly about, uh, we speak, when we talk about pride, we always speak about King Uzziah, right? But the thing is, brothers and sisters, King Uzziah didn't start off like that. You see, to God, what matters is not how we start. To God, what matters is how we end. King Uzziah started his journey, you know, as a champion of God. Let's read King Uzziah's story in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old. He was 16 years old when he became king and made him king in the room of his fa father Amaziah. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah. After that, the king slept with his fathers. Sixteen years old was Uzziah when he began to reign, and he reigned fifty and two years, fifty-two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And he did, ladies, weren't you glad you were not born in those days, <laughs> Jechaliah? <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, um, I was thinking to myself, you know, I'm sure ladies will be happy that they weren't born in those days, you know. Verse 4, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. You see, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He started off very well, according to all that his father Amaziah did. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. As long as he saw the Lord, God made him prosper. You see, my brothers and sisters, as long as you seek him, as long as you are humble and walk in the path of humility, God will prosper you. Let's read. And we keep reading. And he, he went forth and warred against Philistines and break down the wall of Gath and the wall of Jabne and the wall of Ashdod, and build cities about Ashdod and among the Philistines. And God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians that dwelt in Gurbal and the Mehumins. So you see, he fought battles, and every battle he fought, God gave him victory upon victory. And verse 8. And the Ammonites gave gifts to Uzziah, and his, and, and his name spread abroad, even to entering in the Egypt, of, for, for he strengthened himself exceedingly. You see, God made his reputation even to go before him. His reputation was known, by that is how far God exalted him when he walked in the path of humility. Verse 9. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley, valley gate and the turning of the wall and fortified them. Verse 10, also he built towers in the desert and digged many wells, for he had much cattle. See, God prospered him with livestock, gave him everything, both in the low country and in the plains, husbandsmen also, and wine dressers in the mountains and in, and in Carmel for the loud husbandry. Moreover, Uzziah had a host of fighting. God gave him an elite of an army. His, these fighting men were not just ordinary soldiers. They were exceptional soldiers. And how much we will see. And went out to war by bands according to the number of their account by the hand of Jael, the scribe, and Maaseiah, the ruler, and hand of Hananiah of the king's captains. The whole number of the chief of the fathers of the mighty men of valor were 2,600, verse 13, and under their hand was an army 300,000 and 7,500 that made war with mighty power and helped the king against the enemy. So my brothers and sisters, I want you to see how God prospered Uzziah when he was walking in the path of humility. Let's read verse 18. Sorry, let's uh, 16, I think. 
See, verse 16. So when God was doing all things, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up. You see, this was the downfall of Uzziah. Please don't let the blessing of God be your downfall. God will bless you so much. He will lift you up so the whole world will know who you are. That's what he did to Uzziah. But when he knew, and then pride came to him, something like what happened to Lucifer. You know, Bible says Lucifer's heart was lifted up. And same thing happened. Uzziah's heart was lifted. So my brothers and sisters, God will bless you. God will give you houses upon houses or cars upon whatever. Whatever God gives you, you have to all the more be humble. The way to go up is down. The more you humble yourself, you go up. Right? But Uzziah missed on this point. When his heart was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. I love that. His heart was lifted. Because my brothers and sisters, devastation and fall is guaranteed if you are proud. For he transgressed against the Lord for his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar. Now this verse 17. Burning incense in the altar in the temple of God is only an act deserved for the priest. Well done. And, and he took the role of the priest and he tried to do it. Now see, and Azariah the priest went in after him and with foursome priests and, uh, of the Lord and were valiant men. So the, the priests were not just ordinary priests. They were valiant fighting men. And they withstood Uzziah the king and said to him, it appertained not unto thee Uzziah. They didn't even give him the honor of calling him King Uzziah. Because you know what? No one is above the law of God. You can be the king, you can be the queen, you can be the ruler of this world. You are not above the law of God. They called him Uzziah. What are you doing here? You are not, so it is not given to you to burn incense. Um, and let's, let's read verse 19. Uh, sorry, uh, it, it appertained not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, to the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to, bu to burn the incense, to go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for the honor from the Lord God. Verse 19. Now, Uzziah was given a chance. Uzziah was not straightly, he was given a chance to repent. But what did he do? He did not. Instead, he became, how dare you? How do you know who I am? I am the king. That sort of an attitude. So proud people get angry very soon. He was wrath, not just angry. He was wrath. He, was, he would have probably been boiling at that point. And uh, he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was robbed, the priest, the leprosy even rose up. You see, he did not take the chance to repent when the time was given. Instead, he did it anyway. He was angry. And the moment he got angry, God punished him with leprosy. And he was a leper till the day he died. You see? That is what happens. So that's one example. Let's read Daniel chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. Daniel chapter 4, verses. Now, here is the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar says, Nebuchadnezzar the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in the earth, peace be unto you. Two, I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that high God, meaning the God of Israel, had wrought toward me. So he's writing to his entire uh, uh, empire about, he's basically giving his testimony. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion and his generation is to generation. Verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. My brothers and sisters, King Nebuchadnezzar was flourishing in his house and again was at rest. 
so long as he was humble he so long as he was acknowledging whatever i have i have because the god of heaven and earth gave me until as long as he was as- ascribing the greatness to god he was prospering he was flourishing and he was at rest in his own palace now let's read verses 28 onwards verse 28 of the same chapter this man who said like this this man who um uh, uh, who who uh, who who gave god all the glory is now changed verse 28 uh, verse 29 sorry at the end of 12 months he was walking in the kingdom of babylon my my brothers and sisters it only took this man 12 months from being the most humble person to be the most arrogant person now let's read verse 29 says at the end of 12 months he walked in the palace of the kingdom of babylon the king spoke and said is not this great babylon that i have built uh um for the house of the kingdom for my might and the might of my power for the honor of my majesty you know at first he was saying god's majesty god did this god did this god gave this 12 months later he i did this i did this my majesty you know my power my might you see it only took 12 months for a man who is humble to fall down my brothers and sisters watch out it's a daily battle we need to walk in humility uh, uh, you know on a daily basis as a result god made him you know even while those words were still in his mouth there fell a voice from heaven saying o king nebuchadnezzar to there to to thee it is spoken the kingdom is departed that's it gone kingdom is taken off from you god can take things out like that in a second even when he was speaking just like that god took it out so brothers and sisters watch out it only took 12 months for this great man to fall right and but later if you go home and read for the sake of time i'm not reading the rest please go home and read this chapter he came to his senses you see god first of all gives us a chance to repent you see he but the thing is if you don't humble yourself you know what don't worry god can do it for you but if god does it it is going to be public humiliation you see this very powerful majestic man ended eating grass for 7 years isn't that public humiliation isn't that public humiliation so watch out when god gives you a chance to humble yourself take it with both your arms open i say lord i will do it please don't do it for me right and he will give you grace he gives grace to the humble if you say lord i want in this area i you know i fall lord i get angry very soon i you know i need to be humble lord help me he will answer your prayer he will give grace for you to be humble let's read king uh 2 chronicles chapter 33 with this example i will end i will give you another example this is about king manasseh another king of judah a horrible horrible king right manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 50 and 5 years he was one of the longest reigning kings in jerus in judah verse 2 but he did that was evil in the sight of the lord he and like unto the abominations of heathen from the lord had cast out before the children of israel for he built again the high places and hezekiah the father had broken everything his father broke down he lifted up he was one of the bad bad kings in the history of judah he restored the worship of baal he restored the worship of asheroth and everything and i think let's read uh, verse 16 sorry verse uh, 14 please 
sorry. Um, I don't know which verse, but anyway, this, in this chapter, you go home and read for the time's sake. I'm not going to keep searching. The word of God says he greatly humbled himself. When God gave him a chance to repent, the word of God says, I, um, uh, I think it's verse 11. Let's try verse 11. No, verse 9. <laughs> verse 7. Let's go to verse 7. Yeah, okay. Um, And he said, yeah, no, verse 8, let's go to verse I just want to show you the, the part where he, um, verse 9. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to error and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord has destroyed before the children of Israel. Let's read 10. Now, and the Lord spared to Manasseh. This is where what I wanted to come. So you see, Lord is giving him a chance. This is the most horrible king in the history of Judah. He, if you read the first chapter, he'll say his own children he sacrificed in the fire. You see, he's that much of a horrible king. But, you know, God is merciful. God gave him a chance. God himself spoke to Manasseh and his people, but yet they did not hear. You see, proud people, they don't want to be corrected. Proud people, they don't want to receive correction. No, I know, I'm right, thank you. That's not, we ought not to be like that, brothers and sisters. If he humbled and received God's correction, this thing would not have had happened. So verse 11. Wherefore the Lord, because he did not listen to God, and did not receive God's correction, God brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh from the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. Verse 12, and when he was in, afflic and when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly. You see, my brothers and sisters, some people learn as Pastor Sam would say, from a school of hard knots, right? But when God gave him the chance, why would he have to go through this public shame, a king being pulled from his nose from Judah to Babylon? What a shame. That is how God can humble you if you don't humble yourselves. And when in that affliction, then he humbled himself greatly. I only wish he humbled himself greatly when God spoke to him. But he did not. But at the end, at least he came to his senses and asked God forgiveness. So my brothers and sisters, our God is a God of many chances. He will give you chance. He will give me chance upon chance to change. Let's humble ourselves. You see, don't let and wait till God humble you or me because it's going to be very public, it will be done in the open. Right? So let's take this time. Finally, let's read uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 16 to 18. I promise I will finish with this because I want you to know humility is acknowledging that everything you have or you, uh, you own is from God and you give God the glory. If somebody say, brother, you sing very well, uh, six, uh, 16, yeah. Sorry, 6. 6. So if somebody tells, if somebody gives you a compliment, you say, thank God. It's by his grace I am. It's by his grace. Give God all the glory. And God said, therefore, now here before the children of Israel crossed to the land of milk and honey, God is giving them advice. Right? Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, to walk in the ways to fear him. Verse 7, we need to read this all. So we'll go one verse by verse. For the Lord thy God is going to bring you to a good land. A land of brooks of water and fountains and depths and springs out, of, out for valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley and wines and fig trees and pomegranates and land of oil, olive and honey. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. 
When thou hast eaten and are full, thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land that which he hath given you. Don't forget. That is what happened to Uzziah. God lifted him up. He forgot that it is God who gave me. Nebuchadnezzar forgot that it is God who gave me and he said, I, myself, my power got me. And God is giving us an advice. So some of you, maybe God is going to just open gates of prosperity to all of us, to us, to us. but God is simply giving us an example and, and, and advice. Uh, don't forget your God. When you are eaten and are full, don't forget your God. Verse 11. Beware that thou forget the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and are full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein and when thy herds and flocks multiply, when everything you have multiply and thy silver and gold is multiplied. Now God is opening many streams of income to you so you are bank balance is growing and multiplying and all that thou hast is multiplied then thy heart be lifted up watch out don't let the blessing of God be your own downfall for thou forget the Lord thy God your heart is lifted up you become arrogant and proud which br the Lord who brought you out of slavery don't forget don't forget your you know humble beginnings Right? And, and the house of bondage, verse 15. Who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint. Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, that he might, uh, that he might prove thee to do the good at thy latter end. Verse 17 and 18. And thou say in thine heart, my power and my might and the might of my hand gotten me this wealth. Please refrain from saying this. When you are prospering, when God opens you bigger, better jobs, don't say this. My wisdom got this. My degree qualification got this. My this got. No. It is the favor the mercy and the grace of God got to you this. And thou say in thy heart, my power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. Verse 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that gives you power to get wealth. So if your business is booming, you need to know it's not my business knowledge that is making my company boom. It is the grace of God. It is God that has given you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore unto the fathers as it is this day. My brothers and sisters, with this I will end. So please humble yourself. It does not kill you to be humble. You know, when you, when you can give somebody a right piece of your mind, shut it. You know, keep quiet. You know, Bible say, in the multitude of words, there lacketh no sin. We sin with our mouth more than in any other part of our body. You see? So, let's be humble, my brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your loving kindness and tender mercies. Lord, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be humble. You said, Lord, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, I shall hear them and heal their land. So Father, thank you for this opportunity that you saved us from public humiliation. Lord, help us to know and take this as a challenge. And Lord, humble ourselves before you, Lord. Lord, we acknowledge that whatever we have, whatever we own, whatever we know, Lord, it is because of you Lord, if not for you, we wouldn't have had any of that. And having all that without you is equal to nothing, Lord. Father, it is you and you and you alone. Your hand hath given us. 
You were, you were our wisdom to study. You were our strength to do whatever we do, Lord. Father, you are our God. To you be glory, blessing and honor and dominion forever and ever, Lord. Amen.